went on. Because I think one of the things that we have to remember is, man, the Bible, it's not fictional stories. These are actual accounts of things that happen. And there are a lot of things that go into these different accounts that when you look at what Jesus says to Peter in this moment and you add everything in together, you see the seriousness of what it is that Jesus is saying to Peter. And so it's the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples are together. And Jesus tells the disciples, listen, I'm about to be handed over and one of you at this table is going to do it. And so then what you see is the disciples, they kind of all start arguing amongst themselves. It wouldn't be me. I would never do that. Jesus, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Jesus, I bet you I know who it is. And they just start arguing amongst themselves why it would never be them, who they think it could be. They're arguing, they're arguing. And then from them trying to defend themselves on how they won't sell out Jesus, they immediately go to who's going to be the greatest amongst them. So they go from, Jesus, I would never sell you out, but let me tell you something, when you're gone, I'm going to be the greatest. And so they go from this picture of defending themselves to talking about who's going to be the greatest. Jesus tells them, guys, it's not about who's greatest in my kingdom, but it's about being a servant. And then he turns and he looks at Peter. Now, I just want you to put yourself in this place. That the guy that you have followed for the past three years, you have left everything for, friends, family, everything to follow him is saying, I'm about to be handed over. One of you is about to do it. And then he turns and he looks at your leader. This is why he addressed Peter. He, Jesus addressed Peter because G, Peter was the leader of the disciples. So he looks at Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift each of you like wheat. Now what you have to understand is what Jesus is saying to Peter. Where it says Simon, Simon there, you have to remember that, G that Peter's original name was Simon. And Jesus is actually the one that changed Simon's name to Peter. And so he reverts back to his original name for what reason, we're not really sure, maybe to intensify what it was he was saying. But he says Simon, Simon twice. Now he didn't actually say Simon, Simon. It's written that way to show you that it was a term of endearment that it was like a term of love, that he was concerned, that there is care in his voice for what he's saying. Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Now, some of your translations, it may, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. The New Testament was written in Greek, and so that you is actually plural. So what Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you and all the disciples like wheat. Now, that doesn't mean anything unless you know what the biblical picture of being sifted like wheat is. It's a biblical picture of extreme testing. So Peter, Satan has asked to test extremely hard you and the disciples. I want you to feel the weight of that. And then he turns his focus solely to Peter. But Peter... I have pleaded for you in prayer that your faith should not fail you. And when you have repented and turned to me again, go and strengthen your brothers. What we're going to look at this morning is that one sentence. But I have pleaded for you in prayer, Peter, that your faith should not fail you. So when you have repented and turned to me again, go and strengthen your brothers. And I feel like if we can look at that sentence, we're going to break it apart. And we're going to look at what Jesus said to Peter, because I feel like for so many of us, that it will help us to not get burned. Because remember, Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him three times before the rooster crowed once. And so Jesus says this to Peter with the full knowledge of what Peter is going to do. And I believe that it's the same thing that Jesus would say to us with the full knowledge of some of the things that we're gonna to do to burn ourselves. And so we're gonna break this sentence down and we're gonna look at the things that Jesus spoke to Peter. But before we get into that, we guys please pray with me. God, we thank you first and foremost for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you made a way for us to be with you, to be restored, to be redeemed. God, I pray that in these next few moments that we spend together that your Holy Spirit would just speak so clearly to each of us. God, use your words, use the words of your son Jesus, use the words of the Bible, God, to, to soften our hearts and ready our ears, God. God, we thank you for what it is that you're going to do today. 
And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So the first thing, he says, but I have pleaded for you in prayer, Peter, that your faith should not fail you. See, Jesus knew. If you read on in that, Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him three times before the rooster crowed. So what Jesus is telling Peter is, Peter, when you sin, Peter, when you fall, Peter, when you deny me three times before the rooster crows, Peter, I am praying for you that your faith, he's not just praying, he is pleading in prayer for Peter that his faith would not fail him. So what Jesus is saying is, Peter, when you make this mistake, Peter, when you sin, Peter, I pray that you don't stay there. Peter, I pray that you don't stay in that place of brokenness. Peter, I pray that you don't stay in that place of condemnation. Peter, I pray that you don't stay beating yourself up for the mistake that you made. Peter, I pray that your faith does not fail you. Peter, your feelings may fail you. Peter, your thoughts may fail you. Peter, at times your heart may fail you. But Peter, what I'm pleading for you about in prayer more than anything else is your faith doesn't fail you that you don't stay in that place of condemnation. Because here's what a lot of us do, isn't it? We do something wrong, we have a sin issue, and we allow the devil to condemn us. And when the devil condemns us, we stay in a place of brokenness. God, I'm never gonna be able to get out of this. God, I mean, I did this, and God, I'm just always gonna do this, and God, I'm just gonna stay in this place, God. I mean, God, why would you ever want anything to do with me? I mean, God, I'm just so broken. God, I'm just so screwed up. God, I'm just so awful. Peter, I've pleaded for you in prayer that your faith does not fail you. See, the devil wants to condemn you and keep you in that place. Meanwhile, the entire time, Jesus isn't just praying for you and I. The Bible tells us that Jesus is interceding for us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John 2, 1 through 2. It says this, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Has anyone in here never sinned before? We're all on the same page then together. Did anyone not sin today yet? No, everybody? Okay, we're all good. Yeah, we're all on the same page. My wife's in the back. Testify! Um, <laughs> but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Romans 8.34, who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. He is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Hebrews 7.25, therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. God, Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. He's interceding for you. You have an advocate. You have someone that's in your corner. And it's not just a someone. You have your Redeemer. You have your Savior. You have the one that went to the cross for you. And He is interceding for you. He is going to the Father and pleading your case before the Father. And I don't know about you, but I am thankful that in the midst of all my junk, in the midst of all my issues, in the midst of all my sin issues, that Jesus is interceding for me and that He is pleading my case for the Father and He is helping me not to stay in the place of brokenness. And there are so many, and, I've, and listen, and, and I know I, it seems like I talk like this a lot, or talk about this a lot, because I, I feel like our human nature is always to beat ourselves up, isn't it? Like we do something wrong, and God, we're trying to live for you as if like we mess up and we sin, and then God's like, I don't want anything to do with you now, I'm out, you know, like, and then God leaves us. But the picture is that God paints for us is that Jesus is consistently and continuously interceding and pleading for us. And see, I think that we have so much like mythology and so much of this stuff wrapped up in our world that we have this picture of God, that God is waiting like with a lightning bolt in heaven saying, if you make one more mistake, I'm going to smoke you. Like that every time that we make a mistake, that God is there to condemn us, and God is there to yell at us, and God is there to punish us, all of us, because that's the only thing we understand, is like a tally mark system. Like I've done three good things for you, God, but that one thing, I still got two good ones left. As if God's up there like, one, okay, no, bad, two, scratching them out. 
Jesus is interceding for us. And the best picture that I think I can give you of this, this is the way that I, that I see it in my, in my simple head. When my son was learning to walk, when he would take three steps and fall, I wouldn't then lean over him and say, nice try, loser. <laughs> Those little baby legs can't carry you very far, could they? Why don't you do some squats? Better luck next time, champ. 